this right here on this piece of glass in our black void here at UNCG, uh, this isn't the number two. This is the Arabic numeral that represents the number two. This is a video about philosophy, about what philosophy is. And this video is part of the online version of the Find Your Chance at UNCG you know, summer program for Latinx high school students. Um, and it's a way of introducing you to the University of North Carolina Greensboro. In addition to, you know, the sort of historic campus of the university with all the like really old brick buildings and that sort of thing, we also have like a black void, which is where I am right now. This is where they keep the faculty when we're not teaching classes. And so what I'm gonna do here in the next few minutes is I'm gonna try to explain what philosophy is. Philosophy, of course, is just like a word that people use in society, but I'm gonna try to specifically explain the kinds of things that you're gonna see in academic philosophy, that is, the kinds of philosophy that's done in a college classroom, like here at UNCG. So let's start with some examples of philosophical questions. These are the kinds of questions that you'll talk about in a philosophy class. Does God exist? How do I know that I'm not dreaming right now? Do I have free will? Which actions are morally good? What is the just or fair way to arrange society? Does life have a meaning or purpose? Do I have a soul that lives on after my bodily death? Okay, those are philosophical questions. What we do in philosophy is we try to answer these questions rigorously. That is, we're not just listening to someone say what they think the answers to these questions are. We're going to try to produce actual arguments rational arguments that demonstrate that, for example, God exists or doesn't exist, that a certain way of arranging society is fair, and that other ways of arranging society are unfair, right? These are philosophical questions, and philosophy is the activity of answering them seriously, rigorously, the right way, with clear thought and reason. But this is a pretty weird, diverse set of questions. So you might want to know what unifies these questions. That is, what makes a question a philosophical question that we'll try to answer in the philosophy classroom, and what makes something a not a philosophical question, like the kinds of questions that you'll be answering when you're studying biology, or mathematics, or history, or sociology, or whatever else. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna present my answer to the question, what makes a philosophical question philosophical? So the first thing we have to ask about a question, if we're gonna figure out whether it's a philosophical question, is we have to ask whether that question can be answered primarily by way of experiment or observation. Can it, can a question be answered with experimentation or observation? If the answer is yes, yes, then that question is what we call an empirical question. Empirical questions, right, are like the questions of physics or economics or most, frankly, of the subjects that you'll study in college, right? Take, for example, physics. A question in physics might be something like, what gives particles their mass? That's a physical question. And the way that you would answer that question would be by, like, doing a bunch of experiments with like particle colliders or something like that and observing what results from those experiments. All right, that's how you'd answer a physical question or an economic question might be something like, what causes inflation? What causes inflation? Like monetary inflation, that's when the prices of all the goods go up. Well, you do that by observing the system and you know, doing some math and stuff like that, to, um, you know, based on your observations, based on your data gathering. These are all what's said to be empirical questions. None of these are philosophical. So if the answer to can a question be answered with experimentation or observation is yes, then it's an empirical question, and it's not primarily the kind of thing that philosophers deal with. If, on the other hand, 
the answer is no, then what we're dealing with is a non-empirical question. As regards these non-empirical questions, there's immediately another question that we want to ask, which is, can these questions be answered by proof from stipulated definitions or axioms? A definition is just, well, it's the definition of a word that you make up. You make up a term and you define what that term is going to refer to. And axioms are other stipulated claims. Um, they're not the definitions of terms, but they're things that you're just going to take for granted. You're just going to assume them to be true for the purposes of your investigation or whatever. That's an axiom. Can a question be answered by like a proof, by a sort of calculation from definitions that you stipulate? Stipulate just means you make them up, right? Can, an, can a question be answered in that way? If the answer to this is yes, then what you've got is a mathematical question. Let me dwell on this for a minute to make sure it's clear. So think about a mathematical question like, you know, this is a really simple question in arithmetic, but it'll apply to all mathematical questions. Two plus two, what does it equal? That's an example of a mathematical question. Here's the thing, two, we made that up. There is no two. You've never seen a two. You can't go and look in your backyard and find the number two. You can go and look in your backyard and find some particles, and then you can observe things about those particles, right? These are empirical questions. You answer them by observation or by running experiments, right? And in economics, inflation is a real thing. We didn't make up inflation. Inflation happens in your backyard and in the wider economy or whatever. So we want to know about inflation. We need to do experiments and we need to make observations, right? But there aren't any twos anywhere. Two is just an abstract notion. This right here on this piece of glass in our black void here at UNCG, uh, this isn't the number two. This is the Arabic numeral that represents the number two. Here's another numeral. Here, it looks like this, right? That's another numeral. You may be familiar with numerals of this kind from the Super Bowl, right? These are called Roman numerals. They're from Italy. These are called Arabic numerals. They're from the Middle East. Okay, these two numerals are just ways of writing. They're just bits of ink. They're ways of representing the thing, the number two if it exists at all, uh, which is an abstraction. It's something that we stipulated. It's something that we made up. And so we stipulate the definition of the number two, we stipulate the definition of addition, and then we can sort of run a calculation or run a proof from some made up stuff to get the answer, <clears throat> which is four, right? The answer is four, okay. And the answer, by the way, is not the numeral four, it's the number four. So, the way that we know mathematical truths is not by experimentation or observation. It's just by running a proof from some stipulated definitions or axioms. That's how we know the truths of mathematics. We can't run experiments on the number two because we can't find the number two. We can't observe it out in the wild. We can observe numerals, but we don't want to know about numerals when we're doing math. We want to know about numbers. The same thing also applies to geometry, which I'm going to consider, you know, a subgenre of math. This is not a triangle. This is a bunch of ink on a piece of glass in the black void, right? This is a drawing. A triangle is a two-dimensional enclosed three-sided polygon, I think. Um, and so the facts that we know about triangles, and these are real facts, folks, like the fact that the interior angles sum to 180 degrees, we don't know that fact by observing triangles the way that we know facts about, you know, uh, wildebeests and particles and inflation and all sorts of other stuff. We don't know these facts by observation or by running experiments on triangles because we can't catch any triangles and put them in cages or whatever the way we do with mice. Triangles are abstractions, and we know mathematical facts, and so the way we discover those facts is, well, we just make up some definitions. We made up the definition of a triangle. It's a three-sided, two-dimensional polygon, right? We made it up. We stipulated it, and then we ran some proofs from that made-up definition. So 
We know what physics and economics and history and biology are. They're empirical sciences. And we know what mathematics is. It's, it's a non-empirical endeavor, right, that involves answering questions by proof from stipulated definitions or axioms. But what about those questions that are even harder? The questions that can't be answered either by observation or experimentation, nor by some proof that we run from some stipulated definitions or axioms. These are philosophical questions. This is where philosophy goes. Philosophy takes those questions that are real questions and that we need answers to, but that we can't answer just by running some experiments, nor can we answer them by just running some proofs. These are philosophical questions. And if we think about the philosophical questions that I listed out earlier, like what actions are morally good? What actions are morally good? That's a real question. Which actions are the right ones? And which actions are the wrong ones? Well, we're not going to be able to answer a question like that just by experimenting or observing. Watch people act. You can, you can answer the question, what do people do, by observing them. OK, but that's a different question, what do people do? That's different from what should people do? What is the right thing for them to do? In order to know what the right thing for them to do is, the only tool we have is just really clear thought. We're not just stipulating some definitions of good action and bad action and then running proofs from there. We don't want to know, you know what falls under some made up definition of good. I don't want some made up definition of good when I'm answering a question like that. I want to know what, what's really good. We can still answer these philosophical questions. But the only tool that we have for answering these philosophical questions is just clear, rational thought, arguments. And the same for all the other philosophical questions that I mentioned. If you come to the University of North Carolina Greensboro and take a philosophy class, then you're going to analyze proofs or arguments, really, that don't just follow from stipulated definitions or axioms, but arguments that are meant to show that God exists or doesn't exist, that there's such a thing as a human soul that exists after the body dies, or that there's not such a thing as the human soul that exists after the body dies, or that some, some way of acting is a, is a morally good way, or that some way of acting is a morally bad way. So that answers the question, what is philosophy? Philosophy is the rigorous attempt to answer questions that can't be answered by observation or experimentation, nor can they be answered by proofs or calculations from stipulated definitions or axioms. That's what philosophy is. Now, real quick, I want to talk about test scores. You might be thinking at this moment, man, philosophy sounds hard. Yes, philosophy is super hard because you're trying to answer questions with very limited resources. You don't have the resources of experiments or observations. You don't have the resources of proofs or calculations that you can run on a calculator, right? All you have are brains. That's it. That's all you've got. And so answering these questions with just clear thought is very difficult. And if you do it over and over and over again for years, like by majoring in philosophy as an undergraduate here at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, then you're just going to be smart. And if you're smart, typically, you're then going to be able to like do really well on standardized tests. So here, now, at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you about some test scores. Here are the average scores by major for the GMAT. The GMAT is the business school entrance exam if you want to get like an MBA, a Master's of Business Administration, after college. Then you have to take this standardized test called the GMAT. As you can see, philosophy students do pretty well. I mean, physics students, physics majors do the best, but philosophy students do really well, especially for, you know, non-science undergrad majors. They're crushing, you know, history and English and fine arts and, you know, even statistics. Okay, that's cool, that's cool, all right. Now the LSATs. The LSAT is the standardized test that you have to take if you want to get into law school and you want to be a lawyer, right? Now, philosophy has a natural advantage here because, well, lawyering is about making arguments, clear, rigorous, valid arguments. And that's all you do when you study philosophy. So no surprise, 
the philosophy majors do the best on the LSAT. There you go. Then there's the GRE, right? The GRE, I think, stands for the Graduate Requisite Exam. This is sort of like the generic exam that you have to take if you want to go to graduate school in, you know, really any of the normal subjects in biology or history or economics or physics or whatever. You have to take the GRE. The GRE is basically like the SAT again. It's just the same thing. It's not even that much harder. Anyway, if there's three sections. There's like the verbal section and the math section and the writing section. If you take all three of those sections and you weight all three equally for one third and then you make a composite score out of all three, then the results look like this. Just reflect for a minute on how far ahead philosophy is from everything else. The philosophy students are crushing it. They're doing, I mean, way, way, way better on this test, the GRE, than the English students or the political science students or the physics and astronomy students, which of course are themselves doing way, way, way better than like everybody else. What's the conclusion to draw from all this sort of thing? You might think, and this is part of the story, that philosophy is really hard and you practice using your brain answering these philosophical questions and you get really good at getting good scores on these tests because you're really smart. That's part of the story. The other part of the story, if I'm being totally honest, is that philosophy tends to attract students who can think abstractly, right? And so there's a sort of selection effect going on. But anyway, I still think philosophy is really good for getting good test scores. The other thing, which I will mention at the right now as we're ending this video, is that philosophy, as it turns out, somewhat bizarrely, is good for making money. This is not what people expect. But if you look at this chart of the mid-career salaries of non-STEM majors, that means not science, technology, um, engineering, or mathematics. The, the students who major in those make more money. But you know, if you take students that, that major in business or marketing or fashion design or history or English or whatever, well then the philosophy students do the best. They make the most. They make the most money. Okay, here's a question then. Is this a good reason? to major in philosophy, like becoming smart and rich. Is that why you should choose a college major? Well, that question is itself a philosophical question. It's a question about what you should do. And you're not going to answer questions like that with observation or experimentation. Nope. And you're not going to answer a question about what you should do by just running some stipulated proofs from, uh, some running some proofs from stipulated definitions or axioms. So it's not of this type either. The question, why should you do something? Why, what college should you go to? Or whether you should go to college at all? And what you should major in in college? Those themselves are philosophical questions. Did I say the tagline? I don't remember if I said it. Find your chance at UNCG.